Well, Martin, thank you for the very kind introduction and to all of you for your stickability for the last, but I hope not least, session. We've heard a lot at the City Health Conference about exciting interventions to deal with some epidemics like HIV, uh, drug abuse that affects some of the most vulnerable groups in society. But for us to get evidence into policy and to make a difference, uh, true commitment will ultimately be judged by the decision to spend money. And so what I'd like to cover in this last session is what I believe to be one of the biggest and most important debates for the future of health in Glasgow, in the rest of the UK, and the rest of Europe. And that's what is the impact of the macroeconomic crisis, the ongoing recession, and government responses to it, often with deep budget cuts on our health. It's been five years now since the worst recession, since the Great Depression began. Half of Europe's economies are still in recession with growth in the red. People have lost homes, they've lost jobs, and many are trapped in cycles of poverty and unpayable debt. Politicians have been talking endlessly about how to deal with debts and deficits with little regard for what the impact of their decisions will be on our health. And all too often, stories of ordinary people suffering go unheard. You may be wondering who this boy is in the picture. Uh, it's one example. This is Karen McArdle. And at the ripe age of 13, he's already bitter. He's holding a picture, it may be a little bit difficult to see, of his father, Brian, who worked for 20 years as a security guard close to Glasgow in Lanarkshire. Until about two Christmases ago, he suffered a massive stroke, left him blind in one eye, paralyzed, and unable to speak. So he was forced to turn to the government for help to support his family. That government in the hands of the conservative coalition would prove no friend to Brian and the McArdles. For in an effort to tackle what Prime Minister Cameron called an epidemic of welfare scroungers, of people cheating the benefit system, the government contracted with Atos, the French system's integration firm, to conduct fitness for work or work capability assessments. And so like many others, those who were on disability support, Brian was called in for a work capability screening. Brian was a little nervous because he had heard a quarter of these assessments were taking place in buildings that weren't wheelchair accessible. But he went to the assessment and he did his best. Two weeks later, brown envelope came through the post. His benefits had been cut. The next day, Brian dropped dead from a heart attack. And that's why Karen, at the ripe age of 13, is bitter. He blames the government for killing his father. As a public health researcher, it was extremely difficult to understand the government's logic in this conversation. What I have here is a spreadsheet from the Department for Work and Pensions of their estimates for the year that the McArdle's benefits were cut of the magnitude of fraud of persons who were, as they said, cheating the system. And for the year 2011-2012, the overpayment due to fraud was estimated at around two million pounds in this group. When the contract for Atos work assessments was 400 million pounds each year, costing the taxpayer more. And this is but one example of policies as part of government's austerity drives intended to reduce deficits, to cure recessions that have had the opposite of their intended effects. Austerity has been a massive experiment on the people of Europe, the people of Glasgow.
Now, three years after that experiment began, some of the earliest results are in. Purported to improve our economies, it's had the opposite effect. By reducing jobs, by cutting incomes, and dampening spending power, it's led to a negative cycle of lower spending, lower growth. What I have here is a comparison of two countries that illustrates this pattern, the UK and the United States. They're a good matched comparison. Both were at the center of the banking crisis. Wall Street, the city of London, had heavily leveraged banks exposed to the toxic housing bubble, and mortgage crisis. Both countries, both had leaders who bailed out their banks to the tune of over a trillion dollars. And both began to chart a recovery early in the recession, as you can see, coinciding with uh, about a year after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, which happened in the second quarter of 2008, and the injection of huge sums bailing out banks, the economies began an upward march. But a difference came with the transition to the conservative coalition government when Prime Minister Cameron aimed to achieve 83 billion pounds in budget cuts, while in the US, President Barack Obama continued to inject stimulus of over $800 billion into the economy. And that move marked a turning point in the UK's recovery, as you can see with the flattening. And while we do now see signs of green shoots in economic growth, while the US has long since recovered to where its economy was before the crisis began, the UK still, six years later, has not, marking what's been the slowest recovery to a recession in the history we have of recessions. But I'm not here to talk about economics, important as it is, I'm here to talk about health. And what we've learned in our analysis is that social protection is a vital investment in our health and well-being. What I have here is a correlation that shows the link of greater social welfare per, per capita spending, spending on things like early childhood development, cradle to grave, through to old age pension programs and support, and life expectancy on the y-axis. And what I'll argue is that those societies that have fared best in periods of economic hardship have almost always had the strongest social safety nets, the strongest social protections. To test this hypothesis, we've been looking at different cases, historically and in the present crisis. One example is Greece. At one extreme, Greece suffered a series of financial earthquakes, an initial demand shock as tourism dried up and as exports of olives, and fruits uh, began to shrink with a recession. But then it had a real number shock as it was found that much of their budget data were simply made up numbers, aided with a sleight of hand from the likes of Goldman Sachs that made 1 billion euros disappear from its budget sheet only to magically reappear at just the right moment after Greece joined the European Union. But the biggest economic shock and the one with the biggest risks for health was austerity. To meet budget deficit reduction targets set by the Troika, the European Central Bank, the International Monetary Fund and the European Commission, Greece's health care budget has been slashed by 40%. An incredulous journalist asked the health minister, could, health minister, could it really be that you're looking to cut your hospital budget in one year by 40%? And the minister said, uh, it's difficult. Uh, these aren't policies with a surgical scalpel, but a butcher's knife. And often in epidemiology, there's a long lead time between an exposure and an effect smoking and lung cancer decades later, but already the consequences of these deep cuts are beginning to be felt. One is in a large outbreak of HIV concentrated in injection drug users. New HIV infections have more than doubled. Didn't happen at the time when the recession began in Greece in 2007, 2008, but coincided 
with cuts to the needle exchange program, the main program to prevent the spread of disease among high-risk groups in places like inner city Athens. Overall, the needle exchange budget was cut by more than half. The World Health Organization estimates there should be about 200 clean needles uh, per drug user per year. Street charities estimate there are currently about three. And this is just one example. As the mosquito spraying budget was cut in the southern part of the country that helped keep malaria at bay since the early 1970s when the disease was considered all but eradicated, uh, there was a large outbreak for the first time in significant numbers uh, in the past two years, now damaging uh, the tourist industry in that part of Greece. And in a paper that we published in The Lancet, we documented a series of significant health effects of the crisis in Greece, much linked uh, not just to the recession, but its interaction with deep cuts at a time when people needed help the most. Uh, as uh, user fees were introduced to try to shore up health system budget deficits, people reported a 50% increase in being unable to attain medically necessary care. Uh, as the pharmaceutical budget was slashed, companies exited Greece, often in arrears, stripping from the shelves medicines, uh, access to insulin, and antidepressant brands on which people relied. This caused, as The Guardian helpfully documented, a panic in many pharmacies, uh, as it's estimated some pharmacies experienced stockouts of more than 200 drugs. And I could go on, but the point is, Greece's deep austerity measures have had measurable health effects that at this time show no sign of abating. So let me draw your attention then to another economic disaster. If you were in Iceland, in Reykjavik, back in 2008, your TV programming would have been interrupted with this man, Prime Minister Ger Hart. He interrupted TV program with the letters in block white, God bless Iceland, to make his speech. He was warning the Icelanders of bankruptcy, of a period of tremendous hardship. And he had a point for all of Iceland's banks failed. Its debt jumped to a record 800% of GDP as lending schemes like iSave, which promised investors 7% year-on-year returns on investments, completely collapsed. Its market crashed, its unemployment soared, and with nowhere to turn for help, uh, it was forced to the lender of last resort, the International Monetary Fund. And like Greece, Iceland signed up for a deep bailout package, uh, including clauses to cut its health system by 30% of GDP in an effort to repay uh, debtors for the iSave and other banking calamities. But then something quite different happened in Iceland. Under pressure of massive protest, by massive, I mean for a tiny island nation like uh, Iceland, about 10% of its population stormed Althingi House, Iceland's parliament, protesting against the International Monetary Fund, protesting the plan to pay bank bailouts with deep cuts to their vital health and social protection programs. And these protests clearly were noticed. The health minister resigned. We were in Gastelein together, and he took to joking, what's the difference between a vampire and the IMF? Uh, saying one stops sucking your blood after you're already dead. Then this move by the health minister triggered the president of this nation to call for a democratic option, a public vote on how to deal with a financial crisis. And in March 2010, 93% of Icelanders voted no to financing bailouts with deep cuts, a vote that was again upheld in another referendum in 2011. Instead, what Iceland did 
who's injected more money into his health system, pursuing a path of stimulus uh, to try to help cope with the price of imported medicines rising. And we had surveys, thanks to our collaborations with Icelandic colleagues, before and after the crisis. And what we found is that thanks to upholding its investment in his universal health care system, there was no sign of people losing access to health care. There was no marked increase in depression or suicides, so commonly seen in the newly unemployed. Instead, what we found in our surveys is that the people who lost jobs were reporting spending more time with their families and sleeping more. There was even a, a decrease in fast food. So often, we see that people who lose money turn to the cheapest way to fill an empty stomach, often uh, with high-calorie, energy-dense foods. Yet, uh, what happened in Iceland is McDonald's, citing operational difficulties, pulled out of the market. Apparently, uh, importing tomatoes had become too expensive. I hadn't realized there were tomatoes in McDonald's burgers. But there you go. And people instead turned to locally sourced tuna, uh, helping in turn to drive an export-led recovery. Never mind concerns about overfishing. Um, and to top it all, Iceland, which once rated as the world's happiest nation prior to the crisis, in 2011, just out, published in the UN's first World Happiness Report, Iceland rated again in the worst banking crisis relative to the size of an economy in history as one of the world's happiest nations. Did it cost them? What I have is a dashed line showing gr comparing growth in Greece with the solid line growth in Iceland. And I mentioned the made-up numbers problem. The latest available growth data we have in Greece depicts a continued decline where Iceland has embarked on a path of recovery with unemployment now below 5%. Of course, these are two very different nations. Iceland had greater flexibility than Greece, not being a member of the European Union. It could choose to devalue its currency, uh, where Greece couldn't practice monetary policy in the same way. But the contrast proves the important point that even a devastating economic crisis, even losses of homes, jobs, and cycles of debt need not lead to health costs if politicians take steps to protect the health of their people. Fiscal policy is a matter of life and death. To further test this hypothesis, we haven't just looked at two cases. We've looked across Europe and we've looked historically. And we see these patterns play out again and again. Let me draw your attention to the Great Depression, possibly the worst crisis on record. And many commentators have looked to it for inspiration in how to deal with the current mess we're in. And similar to today, economists at the time had a remarkable lack of foresight. Here, a leading economist two days uh, before Black Tuesday when the markets crashed, claims stock prices have reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. And of course, the could dimes could not go on forever. Um, but what may come as a surprise to you is to know that even though unemployment soared to a quarter of the workforce in the US, GDP crashed by a third, overall, mortality rates fell starting in 1929, as I've depicted here. Of course, it was a period where there was a lot going on at the time. And when we drilled into the data, one thing we learned is that driving this trend uh, were countervailing effects. In the short term, suicides rose, but it's a relatively rare event. Much of the downward trend was from a drop in road traffic deaths as people walked more and instead of driving. Road safety was a foreign concept at this time leading cause of death. Uh, but there were two important debates that we can learn from that helped prevent the Great Depression from turning into 
a mortality crisis. And one of these was from one of the most important women's movements at the time, uh, called the Noble Experiment. The US, at the time of the Great Depression, had had a decade of prohibition on alcohol. And the women's slogans, such as these depicted here, lips that touch liquor shall not touch ours, uh, clearly made a difference and were heard by politicians who were mostly men at the time. Now, it was still possible to obtain alcohol through speakeasies and other illegal means, but it made it much more difficult for desperate people to access the means of self-harm. And when it was lifted, in 1933 by President Roosevelt as a strategy to stimulate the economy, it marked a turning point in the history of alcohol-related deaths that's continued since, as seen in this graph. The consequences were never evaluated, but it's safe to infer that the presence of prohibition helps avert at least some of the worst excesses and harms that can be seen in a recession. I'll come back to that in a moment. But the second debate that had a more lasting impact on the health of Americans had to do with austerity or stimulus measures. In the early 1930s, the incumbent President Hoover argued people should pick themselves up from their bootstraps, a policy that seemed to many slightly out of touch, where Roosevelt campaigned on the pledge for a new deal. This created a natural experiment in the U.S. worth evaluating because some states sought to avert the New Deal, particularly right-leaning states, where other democratic states went even further than what Roosevelt proposed. This led to a polarization across the U.S., and we found that those states that went further on the New Deal by each about $100 per capita, or 70 pounds per capita, had significantly fewer suicides pneumonias, and infant deaths. In effect, the New Deal was the biggest public health program ever to be implemented on U.S. soil. Now, this is the opposite to the story that we see in another crisis I want to bring your attention to, the post-communist mortality crisis that happened as Eastern European nations began to transition to capitalism in the early 1990s. You can see the graph of life expectancy in Russia which looks like a roller coaster, and then the bottom fell out in the early 90s. There were over 3 million deaths over and above historical trends. The worst mortality crisis in the past half century in a time of peace. And unlike the Great Depression, where there's prohibition, the Russians had a legendary drinking culture. And surrogate spirits, such as these, which were in fact uh, marketed as perfumes and aftershaves uh, with, uh, by their flavor, lemon flavor, not by their scent, with a flip top cap, uh, because why would you need to use it more than once? It did great harm. And we found in a case control study, people drinking these surrogates were 26-fold uh, more likely to die than drinking other spirits. But the question is, why would people drink them? Because I can assure you, they're absolutely vile. And we looked deeper into the debates at the time, and one of the main underlying factors we found was linked to a debate on how economic change and reform should occur to build capitalism out of the ruins of state socialism. And on one side, there was a group arguing for a gradual approach to recovery with investment, like seen in China, and on the other, there was a group of so-called shock therapists who called for massive privatization and opening of the economy. What we found is this created another natural experiment. And those nations that sought to privatize very rapidly had greater short-term increases in job losses, greater rises in alcohol-related deaths, as seen in this comparison of Russia and Belarus, two countries that had followed similar mortality trends since the 1960s but began to diverge for the first time when Russia, uh, as an archetype of mass privatization, privatized over 100,000 firms within a two-year peri period, uh, whereas Belarus was critiqued as being a Soviet theme park for going so slowly, privatizing only about 10%. Uh, so these contrasts can show us how when confronted 
with a period of economic change and hardship, the outcomes can differ radically, again, depending on how politicians respond. We've looked closer in time to Europe, and we found suicide, one of the commonest uh, outcomes seen to be correlated with recessions and unemployment, are not inevitable outcomes of hardship. Here I have a comparison of Sweden and Spain. And what you can see on my left, your right, is Sweden's bank crisis in the early 1990s. Shown in the red, unemployment jumped about 10 percentage points, a much larger figure than in the UK, um, in particular in Glasgow today. But if you look in the blue, suicides in men fell steadily, as though nothing had happened. Sweden was able to decouple big economic shocks from the health of its population. Whereas if you turn uh, to your left, you'll see Spain, where the peaks and valleys and job losses in the blue map on to the ups and downs in suicide rates. And we looked across Europe and found that to varying degrees, countries fell in this spectrum. And that importantly, the risk of suicide in connection with unemployment depended on government spending and programs to help people return to work, so-called active labor market programs, programs that linked newly unemployed persons with caseworkers, action plans, and where jobs were scarce went further to try to create jobs. We didn't find the same protective effect from just giving cash to the newly unemployed, which was intuitive as just giving cash to people who have lost jobs doesn't replace their sense of purpose uh, meaning or give a reason to get out of bed in the morning. Social protections can make a difference. So with this evidence, historical and from the present, there's an optimistic message for policymakers that if we take smart steps, we can not only help boost economic recoveries, but also save lives. And what is the UK government doing? Well, as you all know, deep austerity measures. Here we have a plot of local areas looking at an index of multiple deprivation for each area and the magnitude of the budget cut that those areas have experienced. Austerity is very clearly regressive, hitting hardest, most greatly, the most deprived parts of the UK. And the consequences are starting to become clear. We've heard stories of bedroom tax suicides. Miss Stephanie Bottrell is one example who, on the day set to be evicted from her home of 18 years, where she had raised her daughters, uh, threw herself in front of a lorry. And hers is a case of more than 1,000 suicides we've identified in the UK over and above historical trends. Uh, here I have an example from men where the blue is unemployment and the red is suicides. And again, the UK is an example that looks more like Spain, where the peaks and valleys in suicide map onto the peaks and valleys in job losses. And if I could extend this further to the present, we would see a polarization across the UK, where austerity leading with it to public sector job cuts hitting hardest the most deprived areas of the UK have led to a polarization and suicidality across the country. Of course, doing this kind of work uh, doesn't mean that even with publishing in scientific journals that everyone will ag agree. And when we published our work on privatization and the mortality crisis in Eastern Europe, uh, the Economist, which was a leading advocate of privatization at the time, took issue with our findings going so far as to reproduce uh, and redraw the post-communist mortality crisis. As you can see here in the bottom line, uh, The Economist had chosen to plot life expectancy in Russia using five-year intervals, but choosing the years two and seven rather than zero and five, making the mortality crisis look like a long-term downward trend. We took to joking that if Stalin could doom millions of lives with a stroke of a pen, the economists could bring them back again with a click of a mouse. With this pattern of denial, uh, 
of the significant health effects of economic policies is one seen again today. Uh, after we published our paper in The Lancet, uh, entitled a Greek Omens of a Greek Tragedy in Health, warning of the health risks of continued reckless austerity measures in Greece, we received a letter from Dr. Lyropoulos saying that there was no hard evidence to prove that the crisis had become a health hazard, claiming the budget reductions, the 40% cuts in hospitals, had been a positive result of improvements in management efficiency. We struggled to understand Lyropoulos's position because just that week, Dr. Mark Springer, uh, director of the European Center for Disease Control, had conducted site visits at hospitals in Greece and concluded that the financial situation was so dire that some hospitals lacked funding for basic equipment, gowns, surgical gloves, alcohol wipes, and warned he felt we had reached one minute to midnight in the battle against drug resistance on the wards. Dr. Friedman, a U.S. director of HIV research, raised alarms that the Greek government were creating an epicenter for HIV spread in Europe. So we struggled to understand why Lyropoulos was defending the indefensible until we learned that he was the chief appointed as the expert panel overseeing the implementation of austerity, in turn receiving large grants from the Ministry of Health. And this goes to remind us of why voices of public health should not remain silent in times of hardship. With our pursuit of evidence, we have the opportunity to learn from successes and mistakes, and where possible, uh, where we succeed, to replicate them. And we've begun to see some financial institutions acknowledge error in their ways. One is the International Monetary Fund. In a paper entitled Growth Forecast Errors and Fiscal Multipliers, the chief economist of the fund said, we underestimated the negative effect of austerity on employment and spending power. They had assumed that cuts would lead to economic growth. And to take a moment to explain this to you, this fiscal multiplier, obscure statistic, goes straight to the heart of the economic debate because it describes the effect of government spending on economic growth. And when that multiplier is, is one, each pound spent yields a pound return. When it's less than one, government spending is shrinking the economy. And when it's greater than one, government spending is helping the economy to grow. The fund had assumed the multiplier was 0.5. But when they took a look at actual data from the recession, they found the multiplier was much higher, closer to 1.7, which would call for stimulus. And that's why the fund apologized to Greece earlier this year and even came to rebuke Chancellor Osborne for continuing to pursue austerity, advising a course of public stimulus, which, ironically, um, has been heard and is happening by stealth. But what was missing in this debate uh, was sight of a big assumption, one that our students wouldn't make, that, and that's that all government spending affects the economy equally. But we wouldn't expect education to have the same effect as environmental spending or health or defense. And so we took the IMF's methods and revisited uh, the debate, but disaggregated government spending into various components. In a paper that's hot off the press two weeks ago, we re-estimated fiscal multipliers and found, as you can see on the right, that health, education, and environmental spending had some of the biggest and most positive fiscal multipliers, in some cases up to uh, three pounds for each pound invested, whereas defense and economic affairs, which includes bank bailout spending lines, tended to be smaller and in some cases negative, which we found was intuitive as those funds led to a trade deficit when money flowed out of the economy to foreign contractors in the case of defense or offshore tax havens in the case of bank bailouts, whereas health and education tended to funnel funds into already overstretched services, more rapidly creating jobs and new spending while providing valuable services that put our economies on a healthier track. And this is a pattern we can see across Europe, that those nations that have greater 
government spending in the past few years, these are the ones on the right here, compared with those with greater cuts um, on your left, such as Greece, um, have had faster recoveries. So at the top end, we see stimulus nations, Sweden, Japan, and Germany. Germany preaches the virtues of austerity for others. So if austerity is bad for our economy, it carries profound risks to our health, then why are we doing it? One possibility is a lack of alternatives. But one of my personal heroes, Nye Bevan, who helped found the NHS, tells us there is an alternative, saying that despite our financial and economic anxieties, we're still able to do the most civilized thing in the world, put the welfare of the sick in front of every other consideration. On the eve he was speaking, when the NHS was founded, debt depicted here in the UK had reached a peak as the economy was in shambles in the aftermath of World War II. But rather than breaking the bank, the massive government investment in setting up universal programs to support the weak helped reduce the debt in half within a decade. It was only years later that we began, in the early 1980s, the upward march in debt that's led us to the situation we're in today. But is it because austerity is perhaps popular that this is what the people want in England and Scotland? We looked at the British social attitudes data, one of the main comparable sources of information on people's welfare attitudes, tracking from the early 1980s through to the present. And what we found here, shown in the bottom dark line, is the proportion of people who say they'd like to reduce taxes and spend less on health, education, and social benefits. And this is for all of the UK, pretty consistently over time, less than 10% of the population say they want to reduce taxes and spend less on health, education, social benefits. The rest would like to keep it at the same level or increase it. And Scotland, in the data we've looked at, is even more supportive of expanding welfare than England. But what is the government doing? The complete opposite. So what I'd like to conclude with is our plan for Europe, a plan that would be popular, a plan that's worked in the past and would work again. We call it a new New Deal. And at its core are three guiding principles. First, to do no harm. This ancient law of higher healing should guide our economic policies. Had austerity been organized like a drug trial with a board of ethics, it would have been discontinued, given evidence of its deadly side effects and the failure of its benefits to accrue. Following Iceland's lead, we could set up a welfare watch staffed by citizens and epidemiologists that monitors and publicly discloses on the health effects of austerity and social policy change. The second is to help people return to work. We should treat unemployment like the pandemic it is, a leading cause of alcoholism, anxiety, suicidal thinking, and depression. What we've learned is that smart investments by politicians to help people return to work not only save money on health care bills and unemployment checks, but help power recovery and can avert some of the worst harms of recessions. Unemployment is a pandemic. And the final recommendation should be no surprise to this conference. Invest in public health. The irony is that the epidemics that Greece is now in the grip of, HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, and drug resistance infections on the wards, are going to cost more to control than they would have been to prevent in the first place. New York City learned this the hard way when in the aftermath of the 70s financial crisis, it cut tuberculosis prevention budgets, saving $100 million. Only three years later, to have a drug-resistant TB outbreak in homeless, persons and drug users that ultimately cost more than a billion dollars. 
to clean up. Investing in health is a wise choice in the good times and an urgent necessity in the worst of times. And just a final bit of shameless self-advertising, <laughs> the body economic. <laughs> Thank you.